Welcome back to the Backyard Professor Chess videos. Here we go. We have more chess miniatures to share. Well, I should say I do. The value of the chess miniatures is they're, they're quick. It doesn't take you forever to get through them. And they have really punch, powerful little lessons and ideas that sometimes are so electrifying that you just can't forget them. And therein is the instructional value of this. So let's see what Blitzman and Rubinstein shows us in 1917. Rubinstein is playing the black. Blitzman is playing the white. We shall see what these two gentlemen do. And for right now, they're doing a chess opening. And you go, dude, that is so profound. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Oh, my. 96, 93. 96. Okay, so the four knights defense. We are involved in a conspiratorial here. Now, notice what black does. Instantly. And it's not really a pin yet because the D pawn hasn't been pushed. But black immediately bumps his knight. So we're, we could have potential exchanges pretty early. And now the white puts his bishop to c4 and now black comes to c5. So the, uh, the argument is who gets best developed and who gets to use their development in the best manner. White is the one to draw first blood, taking the E pawn right out of the center. It gives black an opportunity. White moved a piece twice. It gives black an opportunity to bring out yet another piece, even though black has also moved twice. The development is pretty even at this point. White will bring his knight back down to d3, and now the d5 push right into the center. We always have an argument from the center. White is developed to the point in the center that he doesn't fear exchanging that black pawn. And notice how, very interestingly, both of the black central pawns are now gone. Now... Is this a doomsday scenario for black? Well, it can be if he doesn't play careful. The downside is that the actual possession of the center with pawns is probably a safer way to help control the center if you're intending on occupying the central squares. Pawns backed by the pieces. But black has no pawns. What this does on the other side of the advantageous conceptualization is it opens up the space. It opens up the board so that peace activity can be improved and increase and be stronger felt. So, I mean, there's a good and a bad to it, right? Just We just want to be aware the nature of this particular opening has been such that black is going to use pieces now, and white needs to recognize that, which I'm sure he does. So let's see what happens with this. Queen will just simply come and return the favor and eliminate one of the white central pawns with tempo. Check to the king. The queen out really early, actually, right in the middle of the fracas. Yeah. Right? Bold move, yes. Very interesting, very bold move. He simply blocks the check at this point, so there's no real crisis to be had. The bishop will bump back to d6, and now white will castle. Yeah, that's probably a pretty good idea to castle. And now black will proceed to hit targets. And what this is going to do is rearrange the white pieces so that different influences on different parts of the board can occur. 
Yeah. He bumps back to b3. Now black will fianchetto and observe the what they call the Horowitz bishops of black. I believe that's their Horowitz bishops, I believe. Both bishops just raking over with a queen bishop battery, mind you. Uh, so we see the real importance here of the white guardians of the king, the knights, don't we? Yeah, that knight's defending g2. Otherwise, it's a checkmate right now. So, again, we see based on this position that realistically we'll probably see some sacrificing going on. The question is how flashy, which isn't the intent necessarily, it's much more of a practical nature, even though it really is uh, sometimes completely out of control, zany, crazy, it all has an internal logic to it. So let's keep watching and see what happens. And because of what I just pointed out to you about the potential checkmate, notice how good the placement of the white pieces are in order to improve the defense. double guarding that g2 okay and you go well yeah <laughs> that's where the uh the direct threat is at this point watch black rubenstein puts his queen over on h4 once again the queen on that h file that seems to be a, a fairly common theme in the uh in the miniatures doesn't it that queen is always working at some angle or another from the h-file, and perhaps, this is my speculation, but on the other hand, I could garner an incredible mountain of evidence to demonstrate this. What this does is it loosens up the king side that's castled. And it doesn't matter which side. When the queen gets over on the h-file, and again, there's not a lack of development of the black pieces either. The black pieces can jump right in here with quick sacrifices and combinations, as you can see. So what this queen move does is it induces the weakening of the light squares around the white castle king, doesn't it? Yeah, you can't let that queen stay there and bring more pieces into this. Uh, you've got to somehow regain the initiative. And at this point, because he's been forced into a defensive stance, Black doesn't have a lot of choice except to also use his pawns. The downside is it produces weaknesses. So this is a, this is a characteristic of the miniatures that is always so fun to see and there you go the weaknesses of the light squares there we have it queen a3 and now he will attempt to uh get rid of another defender now watch rubenstein's response again to a threat this is so instructional. He ignores it. And I know, man, I, I'm speaking from experience, this is so hard for us to do. Uh, that's a knight that you're going to lose. And not only just a knight, you guys, but we're talking a developed knight. We're talking a knight that can really come into the action quick. And instead, he bumps the h-pawn. Very interesting. So let's keep watching. Let's keep watching. So it is a knight sacrifice. 
that occurs on the queen side slash center that almost doesn't seem to have anything at all to do with the castle king, does it? I'm, I mean, it's over here, this sacrifice. So what is going on here is it enabled... It was a sacrifice, there's no question about it. It's a sleight of hand. It enabled black to get a pawn attack with, remember, there really are pieces here involved in this. So it's more than just the queen and the pawn, but the idea now is, rather than use a bishop, say, or a knight, although he did sacrifice the knight, but now he's using the pawn to break open the king's side. So, I mean, there's a variety of ways they do this. Queen E2, yeah, you've got to get a better defense of what you have. There's no question uh, black is on your doorstep. And now here comes the crazy move. Here comes the, oh my gosh, I didn't see that. And on top of that response, the response of, oh my gosh, there's no way I would ever play that. And it is precisely that reason why we never see it. <laughs> because it is so bold that it scares us away from even considering it. And this is something that we amateurs, I mean through time, and it does take practice, and it takes a lot of chess games, etc., but we've got to kind of overcome this trepidation of losing material. And I am speaking about myself, I promise. Queen takes h2, check. Pow! <laughs> and you go, oh my goodness. Look, he's already sacrificed a knight. And now he's... <sighs> Be still, my heart. <clears throat> he's gonna throw away the queen when he has so much power coming in that the queen... Why are you throwing away your queen? Why aren't you using her? The fact is, you are. And, and that this is the... You are. You're using her. What she is doing is she is breaking open the king side. Yeah. And this is a hard one. This is just so hard, but it's what makes the miniatures so fun to watch. So, kablam! Queen sacrifice. And now, pawn takes... Pawn... Notice this. The double check. The double check. Check. And all of a sudden it opens up the rook. The sacrifice of the queen, you guys, eliminated the pawn. It eliminated the other pawn. So you're two pawns down. Now that means that the king is truly open, but it involved a new piece, the rook on the file. You do have the knight to g4 that can come in immediately. And you've got both of the bishops here. So the queen was used, but she was used as a sacrifice. It's not like you ran out of power to carry on the attack. And I know I'm explaining too much. But this is really a critical component of what makes the miniatures miniatures as well as so doggone exciting and fun and interesting to watch. And now, of course, kablam. The nature of the sacrifice of the knight and the queen of black changed the structure of the board position. It eliminated a lot of the cover, and it improved the cooperation, it improved the coordination of the bishop and the rook. That, that, that's, that, that is just fantastic stuff to see. That's worth seeing over and over and over again until you, you see the effect. The sacrifice is a loss. That is true. The remarkable thing about the queen sacrifice is, really seriously, it is the biggest loss, other than, say, the checkmate, 
But I mean, material-wise, power-wise, you are really taking the top of the pyramid off when you sacrifice the queen, but it opened up a new cooperative power that black didn't have before. Now you have a fabulous coordination of two pieces, not just one, the queen. And so the sacrifice gave you, ironically, paradoxically, the sacrifice of you losing so much power in the material gives us greater power in the cooperation of a larger number of pieces. And so you can win the game. See, that's something you have to... <laughs> that's just something you have to practice. Don't go away. I have another one of these gems, no joke. That, that is by far one of the coolest I've seen. Very fun to review and look at and study and learn and see. So hang on, I've got one more, man. So let's come back up into our era a little bit. 1976, Pencil versus Galstoff. Let's see what these two show us. E4, E5, knight f3, knight c6, a potential Rui Lopez. Yep, we've got a Rui Lopez. Gioco Piano would have come to here, but we've got the Rui Lopez here, which is fine. And now instantly, he just simply zings the knight out there. So this will be interesting. This will be real interesting. And of course, the exchange of the knights occur here removing the e-pawn so that there is an e-file possible use for black. We shall see how this works out. White will castle. Yeah, in the Rui you usually do castle pretty doggone quick. And now the, the tickling of the white bishop here, which he'll just drop back. And then he brings up his bishop, which is, it makes perfect sense. Secure the center, that makes perfect sense. Get rid of the castle, that's a great move. He's going to adjust his bishop so that he has a different diagonal because, of course, black is going to castle. White just wants to keep his eye on that castled king, right? So black will castle. And now, again, the thrust. So this could potentially give white a chance to have a pretty good pawn storm if he backs it up with pieces rather than peace sacrifices against the castled king. Uh, the king will, and, and yeah, here comes white. So he's announcing his intention. He said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to storm you and I'm going to see how well this goes. This induces black. He's not forced, but it induces him to bump the f6. What this does this demonstration with the f-pawn and then stopping it is, remember he's got the diagonal of the a2 to the g8 and now that's open. So this could bring about some sacrifices and tactics when that happens. We've seen this before in the miniatures and so we're in for potentially a treat and what is one of the themes sincerely now that he's got the diagonal and notice well, I mean, the center's, the center's decent for both of them. But notice there isn't a lot of development right now. And the queen comes up early. Once again, that diagonal to the H-file, man. And this takes practice. Uh, it will a lot of the success when we begin to play like this is really going to depend on how well we read the position, isn't it? Sincerely, where are the opponent's pawns? Where are the opponent's pieces? Uh, what weak squares should we focus on? Theoretically, technically, see, by pushing the f6, it doesn't make it not defended, but now the g column has potential for attacks as well as the H column. We've seen queen sacrifices here, right? This is still pretty cotton picking early in the game, however. 
<laughs> there's not a lot of peace development yet. So let's see. Let's see what happens here. D6, he's going to give himself a chance to open up his queen bishop, right? I mean, black may have to sacrifice a piece to thwart the offensive attack of white, huh? But he's giving himself that chance. So the D6 pawn push makes real good sense. And now here comes a move. When, when we see this, we, we need to realize, okay, this is definitely going to be an attack mode. Because the rook lift is realistically 90% of the time an announcement that I'm going to come at you from the H and the G files. Yeah. When someone makes that move, uh, there, and, and you really have to expect at this point, that means someone could sacrifice a queen even or even a rook or whatever, to break open that kingside because he has that long diagonal with his light-squared bishop, right? So white can get in the mood real quick of making sacrifices. That is an interrelated theme. That's the inner logic of these uh, miniatures that I've been talking about. We've seen this pattern many times, so we understand it doesn't quite come as a shock enough to us. So black will attempt to exchange. One of the ways you can stop the offensive uh, attack of your opponent is exchange the pieces. Yeah, it gets messy with the position. Yeah, it messes up your pawn structures and so on and so forth. But if you exchange enough pieces, there's nothing left to attack with. So that is a very good strategy. Black appears to me to be saying, okay, well, I'm going to exchange. I'm not in as good a position to attack as the white player is, but I'm going to exchange the pieces. That's why the queen to e8 makes sense, right? Yeah. And sure enough, kablam! <laughs> you know, yeah, fantastic move because it opens up the h file. It also does bump the king out in the open, if just briefly, which means that if white can find enough forcing moves, white will maintain the initiative, which will help him put his pieces and pawns in a better coordination to checkmate the black king. See, this, this is all very advanced stuff. And yet, when we see it again and again and again, it almost becomes basic, doesn't it? Because now, what do you think white's going to do? It's so obvious now. Now that you had the courage to recognize the sacrifice of the queen, the one main power, in order to put black in a position to where you can now coordinate two of your pieces, it's worth the sacrifice. Because now the rook comes to h3, check. And the king can't hide back behind the pawns. Bishop. So, this is really cool. Actually, that's mate. It's not mate. Sorry, I read my note wrong. Yeah, the only the only move he has here is the queen to block, and now the mate. Yeah, great little illustration of yes, the sacrifice entails a loss for a different kind of gain, and that's the method. Fantastic stuff, isn't it? I've got another one I want to show you. Yeah, for real. I know, you're getting bored. <laughs> not really. I'm not. I could do this for a month and never get tired of these beautiful, beautiful, fabulous.
fabulously instructive game. So hang on, I got another one. Bailey versus Brown occurred in 1951. Let's see what these two guys give us. E4, E5. Knight F3, Knight C6. Could we have a Joko Piano? No, we're going to go for the Rui again. Good old Rui. It's a fantastic opening. It's an old, old opening. It's been tried, true, tested. There's a trillion variations and a trillion ways to go wrong, just like in any chess opening, of course. And now, in this particular Rui, Black will take the E-pawn pretty quick. So there is an attack directly in the center. The white will put... We've seen this theme before, too. The rook on the E-file can be extremely effective later in the game. So... Black wants to be careful, so he brings his knight. So now, notice the uh, position of the black pieces uh, emphasizing his queen side. Were he to start ramming those pawns on A and B and C up forward, he could have a great queen side attack. Yeah? You don't want to discount that. Now, both of his knights are positioned as such. This would signal to me personally, which I agree with this next move with white, to at least get as fully developed as you can. Because something can happen really fast with two knights on one side of the board. You see what I mean? And and look, it's not a joke. Wait. Yeah, knight, knight will take the bishop. Knight will exchange the bishop on a4. Now, interestingly enough, white really does something cool here. I mean, that wasn't an electrifying move, no. And an and exchange would not be bad for white, although it would misplace his knight way over on the other side of the board. Instead, what white does is he takes the e-pawn. Remember one thing. Now, Jeremy Silman on his imbalances. The idea of the opening is to create an imbalance in our favor and then utilize it, push it, use it as much as we can to keep our advantage. Remember, White owns the e-file with his rook. Right? So can you see... The inner logic of white not worrying about exchanging the knight on the edge of the board and instead, one, taking the central pawn, two, opening up that e-file for his rook, and three, a very powerful future coordination of several of his minor pieces with that rook on the e-file. That knight move is really one of those spectacular moves that doesn't get an exclamation point because it's not full of glitz and glitter and fireworks, but it is very, very powerful. I just want you to recognize that. Without even thinking about it, I know a lot of us would have said, oh, well, he took my bishop. I've got to get rid of that knight. And we would have immediately exchanged the knight. So when, when you get into that mode, try to uh, fight yourself a little bit. Sit on your hands for a moment. Think about it. Check everything that's going on. Recognize that your advantage with this imbalance can become very large if you utilize the position white in my opinion, properly did utilize that position because the file, granted at this time, black is not going to take that file away from white anytime soon, but it's not as useful with the pawn there because now if he does this, it's going to be a long, hard fight to get use of the e-file, right? And the e-file is much stronger than 
simply exchanging a piece and putting your knight way out of play to boot. So, realistically, this is a sensational move. Now, I would argue white has the edge, in, in my opinion. And so he'll exchange the knight, knight takes the knight, and the rook will take the knight, check. See, now the question is, does black still get the option of castling? Well, in this case, yes, because he still does have the bishop to block the check. So it's all good. Black's going to be able to get a castle. So that's not that big of a crisis. But now, and again, I'm going to emphasize this, the coordination of the pieces, because the board, the middle of the board, is so open. It's open territory. There's not a lot of central ponds cluttering it. There's no outposts with pawns coordinated with pieces. It's just pretty much an open field. But white has a centralized dominance and serious potential to develop an attack. So this is what makes that knight move so powerful. Now black will get his castling done, which he really needs to, truly. And now here we go. Knight will continue on his trek. Knight takes e7 check. Holy cow. So, see, he got the bishop back. Or, or I should say, he got the minor piece back. White did with this movement. But look at how much more he really got than just the exchange back. Now his position is really becoming quite dominant. Right? That means something. That makes a difference. So the king comes to h8. And now, and now, man, how many times have we seen that, you guys? Now, observe this position carefully. Notice what white has here that uh, some of us may miss. The knight in this position is seriously deadly because he's stopping the escape squares of the king. There and there. If at all possible, black can't leave that knight there. But now, with the queen coming out, we could see a sacrifice. For the reason that the king can't flee. <laughs> because of the knight on e7. So keep your eyes open for this kind of... And, and once again... With the coordination and the internal logic, where is this happening, you guys, on that e-file? The cooperation of the pieces is overwhelming, which makes this miniature so short, right? So d6, yeah, I, I, there's, there's really precious little else you can do, but you must do that. And now, there you go. Blam. How many times have we seen this theme, you guys? Sincerely. Okay, so let's recap what I've kind of said in every game in this video series, in this video, in this group of videos. The queen's sacrifice is losing the most powerful material piece we have in exchange for another better advantage. So the sacrifice is worth it. Even though it's the most powerful piece. And this is by far the hardest kind of sacrifice for us to make. But let's observe it unfold. This is so remarkable. King take queen. Remember the knight position. Just that simple. Isn't that remarkable? When you really see it unfold step by step, it's just staggering. That sensational miniature. Hold on, don't go away. I have another one that is every bit as good as these previous three. For real. Fun stuff, man. All right, you dirty rats. Here we go. Let's look at this game 
played in 1951 by Carady and Banco. Let's see what these two do. D4, D5. Banco's playing the black, Carady is playing the white pieces. So we've got a queen gambit decline. He did not take the gambit pawn, so no problem, no worry. Now, interestingly enough, he brings the knight to f and the knight to f6, and now the knight out to c3, absolutely, and Banco will solidify his center, which is usually a good thing to do, in my opinion, and white will follow suit, so we're doing good. He's going to keep on developing, bringing his knight out. The bishop will come out, very appropriately lead to d3, and Banco takes the pawn. So, that will mean the bishop will take the pawn, and we have a screaming game here. B5, tickle the bishop. Make the bishop go to where you want him to. Bishop down to d3. And now he will fee and keto and get that long white square diagonal. White very appropriately castles. Get that done. For Pete's sake, this is Pal Banco coming at you. And is he ever coming at you? Notice the advanced thrust of the B pawn already. Isn't that remarkable? He's already in the attack on the queen side. And you go, wow, wow. I mean, that's, wow, that's impressive how fast he got that pawn there. Knight e4, and now look what's following up. c5. Watch the removal of the very important defender of the king's side. And Banco is nowhere near ready to castle, and yet White is already removing future defenders. Really interesting strategy, isn't it? Okay, so we're going to have to keep track of this, and look how it disrupts Banco's position. And you go, wait a minute. You're not forced to exchange with the pawn. Why would you do that? This is pal Banco, by the way. So let's see what he's thinking, because that, to me, personally, I, I probably would not have done that realistically. I wouldn't have messed up the pawn structure. I would have either retaken with the queen, developing a piece with tempo, or retaken with the knight. But instead, Banco takes it with the pawn. So, again, something always new in chess, which makes this game so doggone interesting. So let's keep watching. Queen e2, queen b6. Okay, so the ladies are developed. They're out. How's this going to affect the game? It could affect the game tremendously if we're not careful. And now Banco proceeds to continue his development with the bishop d6. The exchange of the pawns and opening up of the a file for white is really interesting. Banco's response is also quite well to note. He exchanges the D pawn, not the B pawn. The idea, I suspect, is because the doubled up pawns gives a weakness to so many squares. There is a serious white square weakness here on the queen side where your queen resides. That can be completely beneficial to you when you recognize that. There's potential outposts for you with your minor pieces here. So this could get sticky for white. He takes the d4, not only that, but white is stuck with the isolated pawn as well, which can be really tricky. And Okay, now we begin to get a glimpse of the strategy of Banco, don't we? Yeah, he has an open file, well, a partial open file, but he's got a great target at that G pawn for a potential sacrifice. Again, we're getting used to this, aren't we? Which is good. That means our viewing so many of these chess miniatures is beginning to pay off because we're getting used to these themes that 
a sacrifice to destroy the position of the opponent's castle king. I, I mean, even with the rook, even with the queen, or one of the minor pieces, the bishop or the mite, will change the structure. Therefore, it will change the dynamics. Therefore, it will change the capability of your opponent to defend the king. So we might have a future sacrifice, but at least he's got a screen. Now, Banco didn't castle. He wrecked his king side. I want you to keep this in mind, too. He really did wreck his king side. Now it doesn't look so much like an error as a potential future strategy. Now, all of a sudden, the exchange with the G-pawn does not look so foolish, does it? Or, or incorrect, I should say. That's because Benko very, very rarely played foolish moves. So now this is getting remarkably interesting. And he's got the double pawns. And Nimzovic says the double pawns don't have to be seen as a weakness if they can advance and procure important squares for potential outposts with minor pieces. So, so he does advance the pawn here. And now queen takes d4. Blam! There's a lightning bolt move. What on earth? Queen take d4, are you insane? You can't possibly think it's safe to sacrifice the queen in the center of the board until you stop and look at Benko's bishops. Again, the Horowitz bishops at the kingside in conjunction with, remarkably, this work on the G file. Get rid of a queen in a sacrifice? In this case, is this luring a defender away from the critical H2 square? I would say so. <laughs> right? Very remarkable how Banco thought this through, isn't it? This is tremendously interesting to see. And yes, White caught it. So when you see your opponent make a move, don't assume he's just made an error and immediately think, hey, I've got his queen. I've got his queen. He apparently didn't see my knight. I've got a great, I've got the best power on the board. Be real careful. You gotta kind of stop and assess the whole situation. You have a deadly combination of bishops and a rook. So look it over carefully. Yeah, the queen is the best piece, but the position gives you better power. This is something we have to get used to seeing, practicing, believing, experiencing, and doing. The condition, the coordination of the rooks and the bishops is even better than just the queen. So that's why this makes, and again, Now the knight comes up. Notice Banco did not move his queen out of danger. Notice Banco did not move his queen out of danger. He brought his knight to a much better position. Notice Banco did not move his queen out of position. He brought another piece that can make this because he set it up with his distant pieces. His rook has as much influence all the way down that file, 
rather than being close. He still has as much power. The same thing with his bishops. So the piece that was not doing as much, he brought forward. So that if his queen is taken, he still has, and let's count them, one, two, three, now four pieces into the attack. And if white takes that queen with the knight, that will eliminate a defender because it will then be in the wrong place. So the queen ought to be fairly safe. What a lesson! I know, I'm elaborating too much, but what a lesson! Really, really, Now he takes the queen. White is too tempted, and let's watch the debacle immediately. Here comes the lightning bolt. That was the bait. White blew it. Kablam! Check. You see the problem now for white? It's called losing the game. King H1, the only thing you can do. Rook H2, check! Ha ha ha! What a move! Yeah? Look at this! And you go, he just gave him the rook. What are you crowing about? Look at all of the position and you'll see what I'm crowing about. Knight G4 double check bishop and knight. King G1 bishop H2 mate. <laughs> I mean, come on, you've got to love seeing how the sacrifice of a major piece, a queen, a rook, every time opens up a better coordination of a bigger number of your pieces so that you have a more powerful attack because of the sacrifice. The rook opened up the king. And I'm not kidding, it did. Because now this bishop has influence. There's no place for the king to run. So that rook sacrifice on the g2 really did open up the king and it enhanced the power of his bishop, who is way over here on the other side of the universe, but that doesn't matter. That influence is all the way down to that h1. And then the sacrifice of the queen, don't kid yourself, true, I mean a queen and a rook. You're losing big time if all you consider is the material implications. But when you see the position you removed a defender by sacrificing the queen. You removed a defender, the pawn, by sacrificing the rook. You changed the position, and therefore, the influence of each of the pieces in such a way that you actually are better coordinated with all of your pieces covering all of the squares. That is the theme of this entire video. Every single one of these games show us the power of the miniatures to increase our understanding and increase our believability in the idea that sacrificing material, a rook, a queen, a bishop, knight, sometimes even three or four pawns, 
to change the nature of the position as long as you're developing as many pieces as you can, then it should work. And isn't that glorious? I mean, that is fun to know, man. So there is your Backyard Professor Chess video. Have fun, be good, do well, work hard, sleep in every now and then, but not for too long. If you sleep in till noon, you lose half the day. And remember, you're awesome. I'm not kidding. Thank you for all your support and help. Uh, I appreciate you viewing my videos. I do make a stipend with the ads, but it is so utterly minor. I am such small meat and potatoes. I know I've had a couple people complaining about the number of ads. I don't control that. But I do appreciate your support. I appreciate your comments and hitting the like button and subscribing because that supposedly helps the algorithm get my videos viewed more, which is fun because this stuff is fun to show. And come on, admit it. You are having fun learning with these chess miniatures, aren't you? <laughs> I've never had so much fun studying chess as when you get to the chess miniatures. They're a blast. So, in the meantime, I will find more great chess for us to all learn from. Enjoy these videos. Leave me a comment. Leave me a like. Hit the subscribe. Tell your friends you found some kook who's an old man who really loves the game of chess and he actually makes it fun to look at. And I will see you all in the next Backyard Professor Chess video. Don't go away. There's much more chess to come over the course of the next, say, 50 years. Yeah, baby. <laughs>